Tonight, the red-hot rate of inflation cools slightly, except in one crucial area. Food prices are unbelievably expensive right now. The struggle is real as the rising price of groceries takes its toll. Luxury cars, a lavish mansion, and the promise of big money from a budding entrepreneur. Have you seen a case quite like this before? I haven't seen a 23-year-old do something like this before. The so-called crypto king of Canada comes crashing down, and investors are paying the price. There's north of 160 people, north of $35 million. And P.K. Subban calls it a career. I think he will be go down as unapologetically himself. How the defenseman defined himself on the ice and off. This is The National with Ian Hennemansing. At a time when so many Canadians are struggling with the cost of living, there is reason for cautious optimism tonight, with new data showing a drop in the inflation rate for the second straight month, a sign the Bank of Canada's efforts may be starting to have an effect. According to Stats Canada, inflation slowed to 7% in August, down from the 8.1% peak in June, but still far above the central bank's target of 2%. And not everything is getting cheaper. As Nisha Patel explains, food prices are still surging, and that's leading to difficult decisions as Canadians struggle to make ends meet. At the grocery store, everyone knows it. Food prices are unbelievably expensive right now. I gotta tell you, it, it, you stop and think before you put it in the basket now. If you buy something very few or small amount, but you pay very high prices. Today's inflation numbers show grocery bills are rising at the fastest pace in over 40 years. The price of baked goods rose more than 15 percent. Fresh fruit costs 13 percent more. Fish and seafood prices were up 9 percent. Food is more expensive as extreme weather like drought damages crops. And tangled supply chains raise costs for food importers. While Russia's invasion of Ukraine continues to weigh on the global wheat supply. Obviously, there's a lot of pain for households right now because especially lower income households are, uh, spend a greater proportion of their income on food and the basic necessities. Consumers are paying a little less at the pumps. Gas prices fell almost 10% last month. And around the world, prices for commodities like grain are cooling. That's all helping slow inflation here at home, though most prices are still rising, just not as fast as before. Inflation is such a terrible thing because it eats away at our purchasing power. In PEI, Mary Matthews is seeing more families turn to her thrift shop as they try to trim their budgets. Every household is probably asking themselves, how can I make it this month? She hasn't raised her prices yet, but soon she may have to. You still got to pay your rent. You still got to pay your heat and lights. Jennifer Cullen is here shopping secondhand for her young family. I'm changing shoes and clothes every two months with one of my boys. I can always yeah. use one of those. While this keeps some money in yeah, her pocket, she's also cutting back in other ways. Buying stuff on sale, using our bike more, those sort of things, saying no to Starbucks. <laughs> Small changes that could add up to some savings at a time when every penny counts. So, Nisha, inflation has slowed for two months in a row now. Does this take some of the pressure off the Bank of Canada? Well, Ian, this shows that the bank is making some progress on the inflation front, but there's still a long way to go to get down to that 2% target you mentioned earlier. So experts say while we could see a smaller interest rate hike in October, it'll take much more to convince the bank that it can stop its rates entirely. Ian? All right. Nisha, thank you. And so inflation and the economy have been top of mind for many Canadians as food, utilities and shelter become more costly. Today, MPs return to the House of Commons and at the top of their agenda, how to try to address these concerns. Catherine Cullen brings us the latest from Parliament Hill. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Lots of hype before the new Conservative leader even asked his first question. And the intensity wasn't just coming from Conservatives. This is not a time for parlor tricks. This is not a time for shell games. This is a time for real solutions. The Liberals say they are offering those real solutions. New money for kids' dental care, renters, and a credit for low-income Canadians. But they are serving it up with a side of partisan shin-kicking. If, 
you know, the, there's a continuance of the circus, um, then, you know, they'll have to see who will buy tickets. Uh, but I don't think that's what people want. Uh, but I'm not in the Conservative Party. The NDP even put out an attack ad against an opposition leader. We're not worried, but we certainly want to talk about his record. It's very important for folks to know where Pierre Polyev has stood on really important matters that impact workers. With all that hype, how did it play out politically? Will the government cancel these tax hikes so that Canadians can afford to eat, heat and house themselves? Pierre Polyev calling for scrapping the carbon tax and increased pension contributions. But his principal opponent is away at the United Nations, leaving the Liberals talking about contrasting visions. One where our government focuses on the needs of Canadians, Conservatives telling the country that they're on their own. The real pressure and intensity though, well, that comes from outside the House of Commons. With so many struggling with the cost of living, that is likely to be the real driving force in Canadian politics for months to come. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. A senior government source is telling CBC News that Ottawa is leaning towards ending a number of COVID measures by the end of the month. They include dropping the vaccine requirement for those entering Canada, as well as random COVID testing at airports, and making the use of that Arrive Can app optional. However, multiple sources say Prime Minister Justin Trudeau hasn't yet approved the proposals. This next story is about a 23-year-old who's facing serious allegations tonight. He's accused of taking tens of millions from investors, only for that money to disappear. Farah Morali now with a CBC News investigation into the self-described crypto king and what's known about where the money went. On social media, he appeared to be living a life of luxury, renting a $45,000 a month waterfront home in Burlington and owning nearly a dozen high-end vehicles. In this paid content article, Aidan Platursky was dubbed the crypto king of Canada. But beneath the veneer of a crypto prodigy, a different picture. I would suspect there was very little real trading going on at all. This fraud lawyer was contacted by a company who claimed they lost a million dollars to Platursky. He put up a public notice and was flooded with messages from other investors. I've never seen a response like this. There's north of 160 people, north of $35 million. And given the amount of cash that we have seen from various people that have contacted us, cash that people are investing, um, I suspect there's quite a few other people. Groot says clients were told their money was being put into a foreign exchange or crypto trading platform and promised huge weekly returns. Returns that didn't materialize for many like Diane Moore. I'm retired and I'm a senior and uh, what he's done affected me horrifically because that $50,000 that I had I could use. I know couples and unfortunately got in through me, sadly, and they borrowed on their lines of credit, you know, hoping again to make things better for themselves as well. Platursky is now the center of various civil claims and a bankruptcy proceeding, through which $2 million in assets has been seized. At a creditor's meeting, Platursky was asked if he had record of whose money he used and where it went. He responded that he was, quote, very unorganized and didn't keep track of his finances. When asked why he kept investing money when he knew he couldn't repay his investors, his response was, He's a 20-something-year-old kid. In a statement, Platursky's lawyer told us the claims made by investors have been, quote, wildly exaggerated. He claims Platursky never solicited money from anyone and that when others saw how much money he was making, they started offering him their money. He added, shockingly, it seems, but nobody bothered to consider what would happen if the cryptocurrency market plummeted or whether Aiden, as a very young man, was qualified to handle these types of investments. Have you seen a case quite like this before? I haven't seen a 23-year-old do something like this before. There are still plenty of unanswered questions, including how much, if any, of the investors' funds will be returned. Farah Morali, CBC News, Toronto. This was day two of the sexual assault trial of Major General Danny Fortin. He used to be in charge of the government's COVID vaccine campaign. Today, his accuser maintained that Fortin was her attacker more than three decades ago. Ashley Burke has the details and a warning. Some of them are graphic. Major General Danny Fortin arrived at court in his military uniform and medals with his wife and daughter by his side. They sat in the front row as he testified that what he called false accusations have destroyed his reputation. Fortin said he's not the attacker 
and told the judge in French he never entered the complainant's bedroom and said, I have never done anything sexual or physical with her. But the complainant said she's certain it was Fortin who sexually assaulted her in 1988. Back then, they were both cadets in Quebec at the Royal Military College St. Jean. The woman testified that one night she awoke in her bed in the barracks and was horrified. She said, I can assure you without a doubt that it was Danny Fortin standing over me, masturbating himself with my hand. I looked at him. I knew that man. I spent 18 months with him being around day in and day out. The woman said she pushed the attacker away and told him to leave. Afterwards, she told her boyfriend what happened, she said. Her ex-boyfriend testified that he didn't recall that conversation. The defense also referred to inconsistencies in what the woman told investigators and later testified in court, including during an interview originally saying she recognized Fortin's voice during the alleged assault, but then later telling the judge he didn't speak. The case is back in court at the end of October. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Nova Scotia families devastated by that mass shooting of 2020 are making a final plea for officials to learn from their mistakes. Seven months of public hearings are concluding this week. Hearings that left those families feeling let down. Kayla Hounslow shows us what could turn that around. Just getting by. Just getting by. Nick Beaton says getting to hearings hasn't always been easy. He has to juggle work and raising a child after the loss of his wife, Kristen, who was pregnant again. We also need them to know how important it is to us because this, this is our life. His legal team is among those presenting recommendations to the Mass Casualty Commission. They outlined what they see as failures on the part of the RCMP during, after and before a gunman went on a 13-hour killing spree. The perpetrator was subject to no real scrutiny at all and was left free to devastate our communities as he saw fit. Hearings which have largely been held in Halifax are taking place here in Truro this week, about 40 kilometres east of Portapic. It's meant to be accessible to those most affected. Overall, the commissioners have heard from more than 230 witnesses, but only 60 of those have testified publicly. After more than two years and millions of dollars spent on this inquiry, I have more questions than answers. The lawyers say the RCMP must improve how it communicates with families and the public and improve training. They say existing technology for aerial mapping could have made a difference by showing the gunman had an alternative route out of town. What Nova Scotians expect and what the RCMP must insist upon is that members are well trained in all available technology and use that technology regularly. That costs nothing. Nick Beaton says he has lost faith in the process, but still holds out hope for effective recommendations. Just, that's all we have left is hope, because we've tried every, ever, every other avenue. The final report, first promised in November, has now been delayed until next year. Families are calling on commissioners to frankly call out failures and clearly outline how to keep them from happening again. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Truro, Nova Scotia. Hurricane Fiona has blasted Turks and Caicos with fierce winds and rain. It hit as a Category 3 hurricane with winds at more than 175 kilometers an hour. So far, Fiona has left parts of the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico flooded and without power. After Turks and Caicos, it's expected to turn north and it could reach Nova Scotia this weekend at hurricane strength. Tonight, the U.S. has declared a public health emergency in Puerto Rico. As Magda Gabrasalasa shows us, Hurricane Fiona has left the island reeling. Hurricane Fiona has left a trail of destruction. At least three people have died. Here's some of the damage caused in the Dominican Republic by the strong winds and flash flooding. Hundreds of people are staying in shelters. We do know that more than a million households don't have access to water right now. Before that, Fiona hit Puerto Rico pretty hard. About a thousand people had to be rescued by crews. Power is still down for some 90 percent of the people and two thirds of the population has no access to clean water. Last night um, we had no water, no power, barely a little lamp and no internet. We don't have a way of getting information because we don't have uh, TV, radio, internet, nothing works. 
and the governor says it could be days before power is restored for all. This comes five years after Hurricane Maria that claimed the lives of about 3,000 people. The recovery from that is still ongoing. Now, with this hurricane, President Biden has declared a federal emergency. He was on the phone with the governor of Puerto Rico yesterday, committing to keeping the aid coming. Some 300 federal personnel are part of the response and the recovery. The governor of New York is also stepping in to send people over there to help. We'll have over 100 troopers from the New York State Police Department on their way to Puerto Rico uh, over this next week. And as the need continues to arise, we'll be ready to offer other resources and support. Again, the need is likely to be there for a while. The lives impacted and the damage caused by this hurricane might not be known for days or even weeks. Mark de Gebra Salas, CBC News, Washington. The death of a young woman in Iran is sparking protests across the globe. 22-year-old Masa Amani was arrested by that country's morality police, accused of not properly wearing her hijab. She died soon afterwards. As Ithil Musa reports, today the United Nations called for an investigation into her death. Protesters in Vancouver are chanting, women, life, freedom. It's a similar scene in cities across the globe. And in places like Tehran, Toronto and Berlin, women are also chopping off their hair. They're protesting the death of 22-year-old Massa Amini in Iran. The UN says Amini was with her brother in the capital when she was arrested last week for what was considered to be an improper hijab or head covering. There are reports she was beaten on the head with a baton. Amini fell into a coma shortly after being arrested and died three days later. Our office has received numerous and verified videos of violent treatment of women, including slapping women across the face, beating them with batons and throwing them into police vans. The UN says Iran's so-called morality police have in recent months expanded their street patrols. The organization now wants the country's leaders to conduct an impartial probe into Amini's death, a call that is being echoed by Canada's foreign affairs minister, Melanie Jolie. We deserve explanations. Authorities in Iran claim Amini died of a heart attack, but many women there don't believe it and they want answers. They're risking their lives because now they're walking without the hijab on the streets. They're burning that hijab because they don't want that. After the Islamic Revolution in 1979, officers in Iran were given the authority to punish women who were perceived to be showing too much hair, wearing too much makeup, or clothes that were considered too short or too tight. Now, some Iranian Canadians are planning to take their protest against those measures and Amini's death to New York, where Iran's president is expected to speak Wednesday at the UN General Assembly. Idil Moussa, CBC News, Toronto. As we mentioned, the Prime Minister is in New York to attend the UN General Assembly. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. What's the latest on Ukraine? Lots of work to do keeping everyone together. World leaders are there to discuss, among many things, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, a member of the Security Council, also climate change and the COVID pandemic. Trudeau will also attend meetings on gender equality and sustainable development. Along many parts of the front in Ukraine, Russian forces are on the defensive. And there are fears the Kremlin will try to escalate the war. The Ukrainian Defense Ministry posted this video, which CBC News has not verified, of a Ukrainian-held village in the east being showered by Russian incendiary munitions. The material seen here in another attack from April can reportedly burn for several minutes and sticks to clothes and skin. There are signs Russia is moving to formally claim more Ukrainian territory as its own. And as Katie Simpson explains, that could set the stage for Moscow to ramp up military recruitment. An ominous message for the people of Ukraine, delivered by Russian proxies running the occupied territories. He says a referendum on joining Russia will take place in Luhansk, one of four regions that announced a vote within days. President Vladimir Putin appears to be relying on a familiar playbook in an attempt to hold on to the gains he's made. We know that these referenda will be manipulated. 
we know that Russia will use these sham referenda as a basis uh, to purportedly annex these territories either now or in the future. Putin used a similar strategy in 2014, calling a referendum which he used to justify Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea. It was denounced by the West as fake then and is again being condemned now. You can't have a referendum in a country that's under military occupation. That's a joke. I mean, the Russians should give their heads a shake. The war is at a turning point as momentum shifts to Ukraine's side. Soldiers have liberated thousands of kilometers of territory in a matter of weeks. While calling a referendum is widely seen as a sign of weakness, there is worry it could further escalate the conflict. If he declares these territories to be part of Russia, then he can turn to the Russian people and say, Russia is under attack. The fear is Putin would use that reasoning to justify mobilization, recruiting or deploying conscripted soldiers and increasing weapons production. I think he's scrambling, that he's facing the prospect of even more humiliating military defeats in Ukraine. He's losing international support and he's under growing pressure at home and he has, he has no good options at this point. Ukraine is using this moment to pressure Western allies to keep providing weapons. Congress is expected to approve another $12 billion in support before the end of the month. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Back to school is looking a lot different this year with many pandemic restrictions dropped. But for some students, that's raising safety concerns. The objective of public health is to protect the public, all members of the public. Coming up, the difficult choices facing those with compromised immune systems. Plus... A psychedelic drug with therapeutic potential. You will also have a guide with you at all times to ensure your safety. Why some think magic mushrooms offer more than just a good trip. And a little later. Gomez passes on. Suba shoots. Scores! P.K. A well-known Canadian hockey player is calling it quits. What P.K. Subban meant to the game and beyond. We're back in two. Oh, a rude surprise at an Edmonton car dealership, a sinkhole opening up in the parking lot, and has swallowed four cars. Two are new, one used, and the other belonged to a customer. They have been lifted out. The dealership hasn't disclosed the damage to the vehicles. Some students with compromised immune systems are choosing to go back to class after COVID forced them to learn from home. But schools have been relaxing pandemic precautions, creating questions about safety. Deanna Sumanag Johnson looks at the challenges. Grade 12 student Riley Olford has cerebral palsy and chronic lung disease, which makes catching COVID-19 much more dangerous to his health. Yet after two long years learning online, he was missing his friends and teachers. Yeah, it was a difficult decision, especially with everything opening up and there being less restrictions uh, and still really the same amount of COVID. Uh, but it was kind of becoming clear that COVID wasn't going to go away. As schools across Canada open up with barely any COVID measures left, it's a scary world out there for medically vulnerable students or those going home to immunocompromised family members. The objective of public health is to protect the public, all members of the public. This infectious diseases doctor who deals with immunocompromised patients says that relaxing all public health measures in schools shows a lack of social responsibility. When there are measures that are simple and easy to use, and effective, like masks and distancing and indoor ventilation. It, it, it just boggles the mind that we don't, we're not actually using the tools in our, at our disposal to do that. But could any of those measures be reintroduced, especially if virus levels spike in the fall and winter? After all, there is a precedent. Lunches containing peanuts are banned pretty much everywhere to protect the small number of kids who are allergic to them. This bioethicist thinks it could happen. If the risks of COVID are, are very, very well understood by the public, if it's known that these measures can help avert illness, hospitalization, and perhaps even death amongst the most vulnerable amongst us, um, then I think then that, that context changes the acceptability or perceived acceptance of these sorts of measures. Until then, Riley Olford is doing what he can to protect his health. I try to like kind of stay away from other people and wait for crowds to clear out in the hall before I go through the hallway. 
wearing his mask, leaving school earlier to avoid the rush in the hallways, in hope that he too can have a slice of normal school life after two long years of the pandemic. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Amid the pageantry and spectacle of the Queen's funeral, not everyone was happy with the money that was spent on it. While we struggle to heat our homes, we have to pay for your parade. Coming up, we look at the cost of mourning the Queen. Plus, how a psychedelic drug is helping some cope in the face of anxiety. In the UK, some are now debating whether that majestic public farewell to the Queen was worth the cost, even as London starts to return to normal. I think 10 days was a perfect amount for mourning. Any longer, then we wouldn't have a chance to move on as Londoners. As streets are cleared and equipment is hauled away, we're learning that roughly 250,000 people filed past the Queen's coffin to pay their respects as she was lying in state in Parliament. There is no denying the great affection she commanded in the hearts of so many. But some are saying the cost of the farewell could push an already weak economy into recession. Ellen Morrow takes a look. The Queen's funeral was a grand event, a historic moment. And with all of the elaborate ceremony surrounding it, we may never see anything quite like it again. For many, certainly the hundreds of thousands who descended upon London, who waited for hours and hours in the queue to pay their respects, who were moved to tears, it was a fitting tribute to a remarkable life. She's done such an impeccable reign. She meant a lot to the whole country. Those sentiments are the national mood, says this professor. Most people would say it was worth it because of who she was and what she did. It was also worth it because the world's eyes were upon Britain. But there have also been questions about how much it all costs the British taxpayer, especially with the UK facing a deepening cost of living crisis. There's no answer to that question yet, but history gives us some hints. From the Abbey to Westminster Hall, Queen Mother's coffin, In 2002, Britain said goodbye to the Queen Mother. It cost about 5.4 million pounds or about eight million dollars. In 2011, for the wedding of William and Catherine, the British taxpayers paid about six million pounds or over nine million dollars just to cover the security costs. But those events were nowhere near the scale of the Queen's funeral. The logistics, the processions, think about the security cost alone, the biggest ever undertaken by London's Metropolitan Police. The funeral was also a bank holiday with many businesses across the UK closed down. There was another bank holiday back in June for the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. It was linked to a 0.6% drop in GDP that month. And some analysts say the drop in productivity from the funeral could be the final hit that pushes the UK into a recession. Inflation there is already around 10%. Household energy bills are set to go up by a whopping 80% next month. And official statistics show that about half of British adults are buying less food because they can't afford it. All of this will be hanging over the planning for King Charles's coronation expected next year. The Queen's coronation back in 1953 cost 70 million in today's dollars. It was billed as a much needed celebration after the end of the Second World War. The context for King Charles 70 years later is much different. Listen to what happened when he went to Wales before the funeral. While we struggle to heat our homes, we have to pay for your parade. One newspaper said Charles wants a, quote, cost of living coronation and a good value ceremony. Keeping the monarchy good value enough will be the pressure on the palace going forward. That report from our Ellen Morrow. A new trial by Health Canada is looking into the potential healing powers of an illegal psychedelic drug. It has changed the way that I think about the entire concept of death and dying. How magic mushrooms are helping some cope as they grapple with terminal illnesses. Plus, P.K. Subban is hanging up his skates 
what the former Canadian star meant to the game. A terminal disease diagnosis often means not just the physical symptoms, but also crippling depression and anxiety. Nick Purden gives us an inside look at Canadian research into an experimental treatment some believe is revolutionary. It's also currently illegal, magic mushrooms. So over here, this is the room where I have done my first two psychedelic therapy sessions. So right here is uh, where the first legal use of psilocybin therapy happened in Canada. Psilocybin, if you're wondering, is the active ingredient in magic mushrooms. And Thomas Hartle was the first Canadian to legally take them. Psilocybin cubensis. This is footage of Thomas about to go on that first psychedelic trip in 2020. Next to him is a doctor and one of Thomas's good friends. Uh, it was a, a very uh, pure emotional experience. Your entire being is that emotional feeling. So it isn't a matter of feeling it. You, you are that experience. In any given year, hundreds of thousands of Canadians experience depression and anxiety. Could magic mushrooms be a revolution in their treatment? Or as Canadian law tells us right now, are they a dangerous substance we should avoid? To understand how Thomas, in his 50s, found himself hallucinating in his basement in Saskatoon, we need to go back a few years back to the day he was diagnosed with stage four cancer. The anxiety for that was really consuming my, my every minute of every waking day. It felt like I was actively dying. Thomas tried conventional ways to care for his end of life anxiety, such as therapy and meditation. He tried antidepressants too. I know that antidepressants for me were, were able to take like the peaks off of anxiety but uh, they also were taking the peaks off of things like happiness and, and love. When nothing worked, Thomas decided to try magic mushrooms. He applied to Health Canada, and a few months later, they gave him a special exemption to use psilocybin pills in the presence of a medical professional. Thomas says after his four-hour psilocybin experience, the symptoms of his anxiety were basically gone. It gave me the ability to approach the idea that someday I'm going to die and I'm not going to be there when my family needs me. It doesn't change the way that I feel about dying. It has changed the way that I think about the entire concept of death and dying. So unlike a, a drug which changes how you're feeling while you are taking it, this is something that has changed my perspective on it. But here's the thing. Health Canada only gave Thomas the right to use psilocybin for one year, and that's expired. He's asked for a renewal, but months later he's still waiting. As it stands today, it would be illegal to do it here in this room for you. For me right now, it would be completely illegal. So that which was previously the most safe and secure that I could possibly have is now something that would be illegal for me to do. All the way over your feet? Yes, okay, how's that feel? Yes, for like a million bucks? A million There is another way to okay. legally get psilocybin in Canada. You need to find a doctor who's willing to apply for you. That's what Dr. Michael Verbora does for some of his patients. For him, psychedelics are the future of medicine. Remember, you will also have a guide with you at all times to ensure your safety and maximize the healing potential of this psychedelic experience. I got out of med school, uh, well, well, residency about seven or eight years ago, and, and I knew at that moment I could not do what I was trained to do, which is to continue to prescribe pills every day for patients with chronic illnesses who weren't getting better. It was beating my head against the wall. Dr. Verbora is a doctor at Field Trip Health, a private clinic in Toronto that specializes in psychedelics. He says because it's difficult to get permission to use psilocybin, he's only able to administer it to one or two patients a month. Mio Yokoi has stage four pancreatic cancer and end of life anxiety. I thought to myself, if this is something that can help me to have a better quality of life for whatever time I have left, then I would like to try to um, experience that as much as possible. I believe that magic mushrooms can help me not suffer at the end of my life.
Camille wants to spread the message that psilocybin helped her. That's why she allowed us to film her treatment. Dr. Verbora never leaves a patient's side during their experience. And he tells me what he believes the psilocybin molecule is doing inside Mio's brain. He says it's like a reboot. You run software 24-7 on your iPhone or your computer, it starts to get slow and bogged down and it doesn't work good. But if you close all the software, you reset the computer, it tends to be faster and more efficient. And that's how these molecules work. They temporarily suspend the way that we normally think and they allow different parts of our brain to communicate with one another that typically don't communicate. Dr. Verboro is convinced that psilocybin works. But the Center for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto Psychiatrist Dr. Ishrat Hussein isn't so sure. I don't think at this moment that we can say for certain that psilocybin is safe and effective uh, for depression or any other mental health condition. Uh, there is encouraging evidence that it could be safe and effective, but nothing conclusive at present. Dr. Hussein is the lead investigator in a new trial, the first of its kind commissioned by Health Canada to test whether psilocybin works. So this is the CAMH Psychedelic Assisted Psychotherapy Treatment Room. When we're administering the treatment, we want it to be quite ambient, soft lighting, uh, as relaxing as possible uh, for people. Dr. Hussein says there's another question he hopes the trial will answer. Sorry, no. That's whether psilocybin actually needs to induce a psychedelic trip uh, to have therapeutic benefits. Uh, it's assumed psilocybin uh, acts by, by sort of inducing this very powerful hallucinogenic experience uh, and that's why people seek benefit from that approach uh, but as yet nobody's tested that hypothesis. That's important because if there's no psychedelic effect then a patient wouldn't need as much support and the treatment wouldn't be as expensive. These days Thomas Hartle meditates to try to cope with his anxiety but he's not giving up on access to psilocybin. In fact he's taking Health Canada to court as part of a charter challenge. What I am asserting is that it is my right to have access to this treatment, is my right to live and be healthy here in Canada. Um, right now, the only way that I can do that is by having access to psilocybin-assisted therapy. Health Canada won't comment on Hartle's situation because it's before the courts. I, I don't know how I would manage to live with that. Um, without access to that kind of a therapy, it, um, having both cancer and being in this extreme state of anxiety, um, for me, it's not, it's not really living anymore. Nick Purden, CBC News, Saskatoon. Well, let's connect now with Dr. Shimmy Kang, a psychiatrist here in Vancouver. And uh, you were the principal investigator for Canada's first study of its kind on magic mushrooms and their impacts on treatment resistant depression. Tell us who could qualify now for this experimental treatment. Currently, Ian, there's not a lot of options. Uh, one option is the special access where a patient and doctor have to prove that they've tried every other treatment um, and get special approval. That is private pay, so it costs money out of your pocket. The second option is through research studies, clinical trials like the one you mentioned. Uh, there's one in Toronto at CAMH that we just heard about. Uh, those don't cost money. However, there's no guarantee you'll get in, uh, and there's quite tough exclusion criteria as well. And so we saw people in the story taking it under very controlled, supervised circumstances. What would you say to anyone who's watching, who's considering self-medicating without supervision? I say don't do it. Um, these are very powerful plants. Um, yes, they're natural, but we know when used well, they can have profound health effects. We're seeing that. But when not used appropriately in the wrong dose at the wrong time without uh, proper medical supervision, interactions for other health conditions or medications, um, there, there can be serious negative side effects. Uh, however, you know, these are generally safe when used appropriately under appropriate uh, trained experience. Experienced uh, individuals who know how to do these trips. And so given that, where, where do you see this headed in Canada? Do you think it'll become a, a more mainstream treatment? As a psychiatrist, 
this for 20 years. I certainly hope so. We do need more options in mental health as well. Um, I feel that we are at the bridge of more studies. Um, there will be more on their way. We have a lot more research, a lot more work to do in understanding the science. Uh, I'm very hopeful, uh, but I'm also, it's a tale of caution. Uh, we don't want what happened before uh, when the psychedelics emerged um, and they got a very bad name and went uh, illegal and underground and a lot of serious consequences occurred to people's health. So we got to be careful. We have to be cautious. We have to be optimistic. Um, but I think we're definitely headed in the right direction. Dr. Kang, always nice to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you. P.K. Subban announced today he's retiring from hockey after 13 years in the NHL. Gomez passes on, Subban shoots, scores! P.K. Subban! Up next, we'll look at the legacy of the former Habs star and the 18-year-old from Montreal who's now the world youth chess champion. His big move is our moment. Welcome back. P.K. Subban is retiring from the NHL. He played for Nashville and New Jersey, but probably made his biggest impact on the league as a star with the Montreal Canadiens. As Jamie Strachan shows us, Subban is almost as well known for his generosity as his hockey skills. Gomez passes off. Subban shoots. Stars. On the ice, P.K. Subban always stood out. Born in Toronto, Subban was known for his big slap shot and bigger personality. But after 13 years, he says he's ready for life after hockey. I never looked at myself or ever felt like I was just a hockey player, Subban wrote as part of a lengthy social media post. I always looked at myself as a person who happened to play hockey. But he scores! He was a great player. After seven years in Montreal, where he was a two-time All-Star, a blockbuster trade sent Subban to Nashville, where fans embraced the style that often rankled opponents. The NHL is a very buttoned-down, conservative place. Players like to put their head down after they score goals. They don't like to talk about themselves. They don't like to, uh, to put themselves in the spotlight. P.K. Subban said, look, we're athletes, sure, but we're also entertainers. In a predominantly white sport, Subban was one of the game's few black stars and dealt with racism as a young player and as a pro. Last season, he spoke about racism in hockey after his brother Jordan was racially taunted during a minor league game. For people that look like me who have gone through the game of hockey, um, and that's part of the history, whether we like it or not and we're trying to change that. Reluctant to discuss racism early in his career, he's embraced his platform, spearheading the Hockey Diversity Alliance and working in inner city communities to grow the game. He was also generous, donating $10 million to the Montreal Children's Hospital. I think he will be go down as unapologetically himself. Subban's impact can already be seen in arenas across North America. I do think that you're going to see more people like P.K. Subban in the game because of him. You're going to see a lot more players, whether they're black, indigenous, um, um, or other um, from other racialized backgrounds. On the ice, he embraced the fast, modern, offensive game. Off the ice, Subban showed that hockey players could have personality and opinions and sometimes even smile. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. This is Sean Rodrigue Lemieux. He is the first Quebecer and second ever Canadian to win the World Youth Chess Championship. It's a pretty huge achievement, and it's only one move towards accomplishing an even greater goal. His victory and ongoing pursuit of greatness are tonight's moment. So my goal was to get top five, maybe even top three, uh, if everything went well. Um, so getting to first place was uh, something that I didn't expect, but it was a great surprise, of course. And it was a pleasant experience from, from day one. Just staying sharp mentally, staying focused, um, staying in shape. 11 straight days with the, with the game every day. I feel like I really learned how to, to deal with the nerves. Always a good thing to, to put the king in a safe place. I was kind of uh, relaxed for the whole tournament, I would say. Uh, but when it, when it got really important in the last round, I feel like yeah, that was pretty much the only time where I felt the nerves. Um, it feels great. It's a great surprise. You know, there's been uh, quite a few strong players from Quebec over the years. So uh, it feels great to be one of them. Yeah, it felt, felt very, very special. My dream is to get the Grand Master title. It's the most pre prestigious title in chess. And, uh, you know, few Quebecers and Canadians have that title. So uh, I think this would be my next step. Maybe uh, long term would be to try to get into the top 100 in the world. I think that would be uh, my long term goal.
So apparently he's not from a chess obsessed family. His mom says that he got into the game. She wanted him to get into the game to kind of focus a little bit and learn how to stay calm. And then as we heard, he is maybe not on the verge, but certainly on the path to become one of the youngest ever grandmasters, at least from North America. That is the National for September 20th. I'll see you tomorrow night.